Jeff, I've got to get back to the reading room in a Not few minutes all. here. Yeah, no, totally understand. Everybody's so busy. All right. Should see my screen. Yeah, yep. database window. All right. So a couple of vascular cases to start with. This was a very interesting one that, and I don't have a radiograph, unfortunately, but this is a patient who's 60 years old and came in to an outside hospital earlier this year with a new onset of heart failure. And so, of course, this is a PE study. And I don't know the exact reason of why they ended up getting two phases, but they did. And I'll show you in a moment, maybe because they thought it was early, which it is here. You can see there's small effusions, no PE, but uh, this was noticed down here. There's a little bit of calcification in the right upper quadrant. You can see some calcification right there. And on, the, on this repeat, you'll see that most of this is just the superior vena or the inferior vena cava, as you can see. And the question with the calcification was, is this associated with the adrenal gland or not? But if you can scroll down to the very inferior image, you see that the left renal vein is dilated, the IVC is dilated, and then this whole thing looks like just one big vascular mess. And this patient had a history of, you know, decades ago having a right nephrectomy. You can notice that the, the uh, right kidney is conspicuously absent. And the findings in the lungs are simply just uh, pulmonary edema. There's a little bit of septal thickening and, and some pleural effusions. So they did an abdomen and pelvis CT just to further evaluate this. This was all done at the outside hospital. And you can see that there's atherosclerotic calcification of portions of this. And look how big the IVC is below the levels of the renal veins there. Uh, but this was suspected to be an aortocable fistula except in this case, it's not actually aortocable fistula, but it's the right renal artery with a direct fistula to the inferior vena cava. And this is presumably, was presumably due to the patient's prior nephrectomy. And so this had been originally picked up on that CT of the, of the chest. And so it was high output heart failure from this big shunt. Now, this is the study we saw. They got referred here. There was an, they did an embolization and you'll see the little vascular occluder right here. And this is in the primary, the main right renal artery. But as you can see, there are a couple of small accessory renal arteries still providing a little bit of flow into this thing. And you can see it, it is communicating still with the, the IVC here. You can see a little bit of early contrast there, but substantially improved compared to the prior. So I have never seen an aortocable fistula from the renal, well, reno, reno cable fistula, if you want, but I haven't seen one this big. I've seen them in the setting of trauma, you know, lower down, but not from a prior surgery and not presenting with, with new onset of heart failure like this. So I don't know if anybody's seen something like this, but I thought this is a pretty cool case. Yeah, very much so. Very interesting. Not seen one of those. Was the interstitial edema um, bilateral? Um, this it, was, it was, yeah. Okay. So, I think the, the effusions, you know, the effusions are a little bit li larger on the right, as you can see, but there's, some, there's still some septal thickening there on the left as well. Thank you. Now, this vascular case, I have seen a variant of this, um, but the one I showed years ago, not quite the same thing. I was suspecting it was going to be the same thing until I looked at the CT. This is a patient who has end-stage renal disease. You can see their bones look a little bit dense. Uh, but I mean, nothing else really on the on this radiograph, I think, that, that would argue for that, except maybe, and we'll see what there is next to the aortic arch here, but they have this abnormal right mediastinal convexity here. And of course, in patients with longstanding end-stage renal disease, you know, vascular abnormalities and, and va alternative vascular pathways are always a consideration. And so this patient had had a prior CT from earlier this year. And I thought this was going to be just a dilated azagous arch, you know, really dilated azagous vein aneurysm as I've shown before and I think we've seen. But in this case, it's not the azagous vein, but you can see it's just the, the superior vena cava itself, which is very dilated. And then 
it does communicate with the right atrium, but I think it's pretty stenosed distally. Mm. And what's interesting about this is if you go back in time, this has been progressive dilation. Back in 2009, you could, the azagous vein and the superior vena cava look completely normal. Uh, by whatever this is, this was 2019, you can see they have an indwelling tunneled catheter on the left side. It's starting to dilate, the superior vena cava is. This was a CT back in 2019. And it's big, but it's not as big as it was. And so, I don't know, I guess you just call this a superior vena cava aneurysm. It's, it's dilating more than twice the, its normal caliber, and it's presumably just due to stenosis distally from the indwelling catheters. And I can't remember if somebody has shown a, a SVC aneurysm before or not. I think I thought I showed, someone has. But I, I showed remember. one. Yeah, we published a case like in 2009 of one, and I think I showed that case. But ours didn't have a real identifiable cause, like there wasn't a stenosis or anything. It was just an incidental. Yeah. You wonder maybe is is that a with that catheter in there if that maybe there was an injury at some point I don't know if it's just from the a stenosis. Yeah, I don't know. It was just like progressive, progressively dilating. This is 2017. I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, just because of the fusiform configuration, I would assume it's probably just related to pressure and flow. Granted, it's you know there shouldn't be that much pressure in the SVC, but. I don't know. I would expect a. I would think an an injury would be more focal, but maybe you're right. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, ours was a saccular one, but we there was just, it was just an incidental finding. So who knows? But yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting. And then the last one's just a quickie, but this is a, a radiograph that I saw a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Does anybody see anything on the PA radiograph? Um. Is there something over one of those ribs, like where the first rib crosses that posterior? No, nah, this is this is fine. Okay. Well, check out the lateral; it'll jump out at you immediately. Oh yeah. <laughs> if you have a good lateral search pattern, this is one of the best examples I've ever seen. I think the positioning is very convenient that they exaggerated a little bit of rotation, so you can see magnification of the right ribs, and lo and behold, right back here, there is a nodule and I think it's right here. You know, you can, I mean, not that I would ever call that, but well, that yeah. thing right there. Now, this patient did have a CT four years ago, and sure enough, there is a little nodule back here. And I honestly don't know what this is. I don't, you know, there's not confident enough to say that's clearly macroscopic fat. It looks like it's probably the same size now. I think they may just repeat a CT just to see for sure. Uh, if this is some sort of non-calcified granuloma that's that's still there or, or what it is. But I thought this was one of the best nodule detections on a lateral I had, had ever seen. But can you, scroll on? Yeah. Thomas, can you scroll on down? There's a hump in that posterior yep. hemi diaphragm. Yep, yeah, there's a small little boctilac hernia mm. right there. Yep, thank you. But yeah, that was the nodule of interest right there. So yeah, serendipity in a way. That's yep. Close. All right, that's it for me, Jeff. All right, thanks, Travis. All right, who wants to go next? I have one case that's kind of vascular. Okay. Can people see a uh, quad display here? We do. This, <laughs> this person has an abnormal radiograph currently. You can see that there's a lot of consolidation and there's some pleural effusion on the left. So uh, things are not doing well for this patient. The history is that this is a diabetic patient who had COVID during the summer. And let me show you um, an aug early August uh, CT scan to show you that there are a few um, peripheral lung nodules, calcification, I mean, not calcifications, or, but consolidation, and some basal stuff. Nothing too scary at this point. But uh, about a week after that, there is a big, scary cavitating lesion in the left apex. So it's got a dense rind, central cavitation, 
and some surrounding ground glass. Um, they cultured mucor and um, staphylococcus. There are some other lung nodules. I'm not quite sure when the onset of COVID was, where this stands in the COVID history. These are all outside exams, um, these CTs. So things um, have not gone well. And here's the current radiograph on this person, or the current CT. And you can see that there is this huge cavity here. Uh, there's an abscess that has destroyed ribs and extends into the chest wall, mm -hmm. is lying underneath the pectoral muscle there. There's pleural effusion, and there's at least atelectasis in this left lower lobe. I don't see any um, absence of contrast there to suggest that there's necrotic stuff in that lower lobe. The lower lobe may be okay. And this person then hemoptysized, and we see the cause of the hemoptysis here. There's a Rasmussen aneurysm of the pulmonary artery here. So pulmonary artery is heading out in this direction, and then is dilated here. So this is probably the source of his um, hemoptysis, and he bled into this lesion as well. So um, you know, the question is how much of the, one of the questions is how much of this lesion is mucor, is fungal, and how much is the staphylococcus that they got out of him. They think they've treated the staphylococcus. Uh, it's hard to treat uh, mucor and it's harder again when you have a big abscess cavity like this to treat anything without drainage so lesions like this cannot really be sterilized with uh, antibiotic they have to be drained and they're really hesitant to do anything because of the risk of setting off massive hemorrhage so a case of Rasmussen aneurysm uh, related to infection in the apex instead of being TB the classic situation it's probably mucor Mucor is good for invading chest wall as well. I think it's mucor and rather than staph is the cause of most of this abnormality, but it's probably a, a polyflora uh, um, causation here. So bad fungal infection complicating COVID and now leading to um, a Rasmussen aneurysm and almost, you know, um, Lung abscess necessitans here, close to breaking through. Yeah, wow, bad luck, uh, David. When the patient um, was the patient's diabetes poorly controlled, or did they become like hyperglycemic uh, during their infection? Yeah, that would be a that, that's a good question, and I haven't had a chance to um, gather the history. This case was just presented uh, a couple of hours ago. So I don't know exactly what was going on. And I don't know whether it was type one or type two diabetes. Okay, um, so I, you know, I've been collecting recently complications of COVID and this definitely goes on the list. We have another patient with a bronchopleural fistula, bad ARDS who was on um, um, ECMO for several weeks, left with ARDS, developed pneumatoceles in the left lung, and then bronchopleural fistula. So that person is still in the hospital too. So COVID has not been kind. Okay, really? guys, that's it. All right. Yeah, I've seen a couple cases with some pretty sizable pneumatoceles from COVID, AR, uh, you know, DAD from on, and on ECMO. Uh, right. But we, I mean, it's not specific to COVID, but I have seen a few. Okay, um, who's next? I can go anytime, Jeff. All right. Um, let's start with this one. This is really a nice uh, teaching case from several points of view. This is a, a trauma patient, uh, not to the chest. Patient is in the ICU, assisted ventilation. So here on the 26th, we have substantial opacity in the right lower and middle lobes consistent with atelectatic lung. The next day, we can see that the atelectasis on the right side is gone, but we have substantial opacity on the left side consistent with atelectatic lung. The other finding that's present here, which is hard to see 
but I'm going to try and show you the pleural line of pneumothorax, which is, you may or may not be able to see it, but it's here. And the other findings of pneumothorax are as follows in the patient who's recumbent. I teach that anytime you see very sharp interfaces related to structures like here at the right atrium, the diaphragm, wonder about the contact of pleural air anteriorly with those structures. And here too, we have findings consistent with pleural air as well. Um, that wasn't noticed, uh, no chest tube was placed. So now we go to the next day and we see that the left is improved and now we're back again with the right lower in particular, atelectasis. Now we have the appearance of pneumomedia steinum. So here, the left cardiac apex is now very well defined. And one can see that there is air in the mediastinal fat that previously effaced the left cardiac apex with a thin line. And we also have findings of pneumomediastinum elsewhere traversing the thoracic inlet. There is a little bit of pleural air. So those are relatively quick changes. Let's go now to later on the same day. So this is just after midnight. This is 5.27 a.m. Now we have some right upper lobe atelectasis. Things have been proved in the right lower lobe. What I think is very interesting about <clears throat> this is that now we have quite a bit of pleural space gas here. And when we have that kind of volume loss and pleural space gas, I'm thinking of pneumothorax ex vacuo and attributing the pleural space gas to the right upper lobe atelectasis. Again, no chest tube. So that's it. 5.27 a.m. This is 2.53 p.m. same day. Things are much improved. Pleural gas gone, right upper lobe expanded, left lower lobe atelectasis. So really interesting findings. And anyone think that the notion that this is pneumothorax ex vacuo, even though if it's nitrogen gas is implausible? I think it's likely myself. David, I think you like this case. I'm not very good at uh, pneumothorax ex vacuo. The, you know, I guess my hesitation in this case mm -hmm. is that there was pneumothorax before there was the right upper lobe collapse. Yes. And so I think in the presence of right upper lobe, you know, I think there was pneumothorax there and then the right upper lobe collapsed and it's exaggerating the pneumothorax in that region because of the volume loss. <clears throat> yeah, I wondered about that too. Yeah. But there is quite a bit. And then it clearly diminishes, right, in just a few hours, some hours. Yeah. Yeah. Without any chest tube or anything. So, of course, we'll never know, but it's an intriguing thought, I think. But nice examples of shifting atelectasis quickly and, and I think maybe pneumothorax ex vacuo. The new media did not increase. Let's call this ping pong atelectasis. How, how's that? Yeah, that's good too. Yeah. All right, good. Next patient is this person. So I'll give you some history in a moment, but I will show you that this person has disease affecting multiple locations. So the dominant finding here, of course, is right pleural effusion. I will show you that the CT shows, in addition to the pleural fluid, that there are nodular opacities in the lungs. Um, some of them are not quite spherical. They're slightly irregularly shaped. So let me show you here small nodular opacities, some located in close proximity to vessels. 
and small guys maybe here and here and here it's kind of the more you look the more you see not your low opacities but some of them are clearly however one might describe them as slightly <clears throat> with slightly lobulated margins i'll also show you that a finding here is extensive axillary lymph node enlargement now i will show you that the person has disease down here in the inguinal regions about those vessels. And it turns out that some of these lesions here, skin thickening and nodules related to skin, are also real. So it turns out that this patient, um, on questioning, described the presence of skin lesions over many years, some of which had actually increased. But the diagnosis was only made this past May. So what's interesting about the pathology in this person, who turns out to have AIDS, is that he has Kaposi sarcoma, in relation to the skin. The axillary lymph node showed both Kaposi sarcoma and Castleman's disease. The pleural fluid analysis showed findings very consistent with so-called primary effusion lymphoma. And presumably the nodules in the lungs are also Kaposi sarcoma in the lungs. So a person with many of the pathologies we know patients with AIDS develop in the same patient. Again, primary effusion lymphoma and Kaposi in lymph nodes, skin and Castleman's disease in one of the lymph nodes as well, right there. This case is a complete teaching file for uh, HHV disease, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, right there. So typically, uh, let's see if I got it. The um, primary effusion lymphoma is usually diagnosable because it's a B cell lymphoma, HHV8, EBV, diagnostic of primary effusion lymphoma. Yeah. The next one is also interesting because it involves multiple places. So we'll start with the chest because that's what we do. And here we have extensive disease in relation to pleural surfaces. The more you look at this disease, you recognize that by virtue of its relationship to extra pleural fat, that the disease undoubtedly extends and involves the extra pleural compartment in the inner portion of the chest, lobulated, rather extensive, pleural and extra pleural disease. In the abdomen, my colleagues described some pancreatic enlargement, diffuse. In looking at the biliary tree, they thought that the wall of the gallbladder and perhaps some of the bile ducts was thickened and also enhancing and they also thought that there was abnormal tissue in the porta hepatis surrounding some of the vessels as well. And we also have spine disease. So the diagnosis, um, we initially thought maybe this might be an interesting case of IgG4 related disease involving multiple locations, but of course lymphoma can do that as well. A biopsy was derived from a paraspinal tissue biopsy, and this does turn out to be lymphoma, not IgG4. So a diffuse large B cell lymphoma involving those locations. So certainly in the chest, one can definitely see lymphoma present in this fashion. One can see IgG4 
sorry, disease also present in this fashion with pleural and extra pleural soft tissue growing like that. So an interesting presentation of lymphoma. Okay, Jeff, those are my cases for this week. All right, thank you. Let's see who else do we have on. Peter, do you have any cases? I have, I have two, Jeff. Yep, go ahead. Make you the presenter here. Start off with this case. Um, it's a uh, mediastinal mass. Um, and this is the post op. So, this is the pre op. So, you can see this very uh, peripherally enhancing mass. Essentially, it looks kind of necrotic, a little density. Um, here in the in the mediastinum, it's actually uh, underneath the pericardium. So this is a, as you would expect, this is a paraganglioma. And uh, one interesting thing about it is, I thought it was completely hidden on the chest radiograph, and that you couldn't really see it on the, I, at least I couldn't see it on the uh, AP or on the lateral. Um, it's actually hidden right here. So unless you see some contour right there, yeah. some contour abnormality, which I would not, I wouldn't be able to see that. But um, this was uh, taken out um, a few days ago. And this is just a nice intra-op image that the surgeon shared with me. Um, so here's the, here's the, the head is up here. So this is superior, inferior. This is the right ventricle. And this is the bloody kind of the, uh, the mass right here very vascular and then this is the ascending aorta and this is the pulmonary artery so you can see it draped right over the um, aorta and it turns out it was it's actually not easy to take it seems well circumscribed but it's uh, intimately involving the uh, aortic root in RVOT so uh, intraoperatively they had to uh, re resect part of the uh, sinus of Valsalva and then they had to do a cabbage with the right coronary artery and then they had to resect and um, fix the RBOT and then had to put a pulmonary valve replacement. So it's just kind of a complex uh, case. And this is uh, the post-operative CT from today. So, arrogant uh, glioma. And this one is a, another case that I have. Start off with the chest radiograph. Young lady in her, this is from about five years ago. She's a young lady in her uh, early 30s, um, presented to our institution um, with shortness of breath, but also a lot of uh, arthritic pains. Um, and so this is her chest radiograph. You can see diffuse lung disease. And here's her initial CT. See, yeah, so from 2015, this is her initial CT. Diffuse uh, ground glass opacities. Um, and you can see here peripherally in the upper lobes, there's some fibrosis. So, this is the ground glass is most likely, uh, if you're just looking at this image, you would think it's uh, interstitial uh, fine fibrosis. And you can see some fibrotic changes here, notably in the upper lobes with some uh, honeycombing appearance. So this progressed over the next two years. Um, so here's her CT from um, 2017 on the right. So you can see the progression. So this is over two years. Um, and in between these scans, she was seen by dermatology and ophthalmology. and then, they noted she had uh, oculocutaneous uh, albinism. So she was given a presumed diagnosis of uh, hermansky pudlak syndrome. And uh, that was confirmed with uh, genetic testing. And mm. Her platelets were also abnormal, which is one of the other disorders that are associated with that syndrome. Um, was she of uh, Puerto Rican heritage? 
Right. Yeah. So yeah. So much more prevalent in Puerto Rico, uh, but she was not actually. Really. Oh. Um, yeah. So the prevalence in Puerto Rico is one in eighteen hundred, and then the rest of the world is one in um, five hundred thousand. So significantly more prevalent in no kidding. Northwest Puerto Rico. Uh, one of the articles I saw is that they've only we've only seen about a hundred cases in the U.S. and they have about four hundred patients in Puerto Rico. Uh, but they think the the number of patients might be undercounted in the U.S. just because some some might be und undiagnosed. Um, here is her. Well, that's the. Here's her. Uh, so she she underwent a few years ago. She underwent um, lung transplant. We're just following her post transplant. She's doing well. Here's her um, path uh, on the explant lung. So uh, interstitial um, fibrosis, which is what they uh, progress over time, but essentially they uh, it's a cellular storage uh, disease, and they uh, they get these vacuolated pneumo type two pneumocytes. Um, is what they see on histopathology and then on electromicroscopy within these vacuoles they um, notice which is a specific finding is the giant lamellar bodies so and then eventually over time that kind of uh, uh, progresses kind of at the rate of UIP uh, and on histopathology they see UIP fibrosis obviously on imaging it doesn't look like UIP um, I didn't have, I didn't track down the, the path, but I just pulled up a uh, article to see what these vacuolated pneumocytes look like. And here's what, here's what they are. Just basically pneumocytes with large vacuoles, what the arrows are. Really interesting. Um, so the three disorders that, that are associated with uh, this are uh, the al oculocutaneous albinism, um, platelet platelet dysfunction, which she she had also her platelets were worked up, and then accumulation of this uh, complex of protein and fat within cells, and that causes tissue destruction, including in the lungs, and then it um, progresses to fibrosis kind of a non-specific fibrotic pattern that doesn't really fit any of our common uh, interstitial pneumonias that we see. But very nice sub subplural sparing. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Yeah, I guess so you can think of NSIP type of, type of look here, right? Right. Uh, ground glass and subplural sparing yeah it really does have that yeah interestingly on the path they, they talked about uip and not nsip yeah, that's, but, yeah, that's my understanding is is that the path is often uip but we know patients with nsip pattern on ct can have uip path right but yeah it, it's with this yeah. with a non ipf look of weird looking lungs think of genetic disorders yeah yeah I'm, I'm sorry. Did, did does the patient have any? Was it is it uh, albinism and hearing problems? Yeah, they. Uh, I don't. I didn't see anything about hearing problems, but they do have uh, 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 oculocutaneous albinism. Okay, cool. That's actually how they were initially. That's initially how that this diagnosis was suspected. Okay. Because we, she was seen initially by rheumatology, and they noticed noted her RF factor. And she had RF factor was positive. So I think that they think they she concurrently also has rheumatoid arthritis. But then she was seen by other by uh, dermatology and ophthalmology. They found they noted that she was she had albinism, and then that led to the uh, genetic test, which confirmed the she 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 had the the genetic test confirmed uh, her Mansky Bullock, and then her on pathology, her lungs are also consistent with it. Excellent cool. case, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can send a. I'll I'll, I'll make sure to send this one out. Thank you. That's that's all I have. All right. Um, I can show three. All right. So I'll just start with this one. This was just a. It's a good teaching case because it's rare that we see um, all four valves on a chest radiograph. So this patient um, has. Uh, 
congenital heart disease and has um, a bunch of valves. So you can see we have a pulmonic stent valve, so melody valve here. We have a bioprosthetic aortic valve. We have a tricuspid stent valve, which I've not seen before. And then we have a mosaic mitral valve here. And so when teaching anatomy, this is good for first year residents and students as well. You can see the relationship between the mitral and aortic valves are always right up against each other. The pulmonic valve being the highest one and the uh, tricuspid valve being the most medial and anterior valve. So uh, it's, I think this is one of the few cases I've ever seen with all four valve prostheses in place. I don't have a CT, but you really don't need it. So that's just kind of a one to say for your, your residents. Um, this case is kind of a fun one too. So this patient um, has a very interesting radiograph and you can see there's a left effusion, but there's this extra density here on the right. Oh, there's actually three densities. So probably uh, an atrium, a right atrium here, a left atrium here, but then there's this extra opacity here. And then there's all this, there's something down here in the lower portion of the chest. If we go to the lateral view, and let me see if I can flip this. Uh, Howard, what's the hot key to do a flip? Um, no, I can't remember. You just go to uh, ED viewer and go to... Orientation. Flip. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, so there's this funny posterior mediastinal or posterior you know, behind the heart mass here. And um, uh, this definitely is one of the... So this is a, a non-contrast chest CT. And you'll see the azagous vein is quite large. Um, and then there's all this just soft tissue here. There's the esophagus in the lower mediastinum. But what's cool is I'm pointing at this calcification in these, and it looks like it's calcification in on the walls of some of these structures here. They look kind of tubular. And if you go to the abdomen, you can see there's a big spleen and uh, liver's a little bit nodular and there's a little bit of ascites and stuff. Um, so I did find a contrasted study. And if we go up, from below, let's see, go this way, we can see that these are actually massive varices um, mm. with calcification. So I wonder if this is atherosclerosis in a vein from long oh, venous hypertension. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Um, and these, I think these are the biggest varices I've ever seen. We don't have the whole chest. It was part of an abdomen, but uh, I didn't see any funny connections, but I wonder if some of these end up going into some of the pulmonary veins. The left atrium is not big, but just... I've not seen atherosclerotic varices before, but you guys agree that's probably what this is, just from long-standing elevated pressure, and the vein's not wow. really equipped to handle it. It's a good thought. I don't think I've seen that before. Wow. Yeah, so I, I was glad I had the non-contrast because it just brings it out, I and mean, you can see it on here, but when you're trying to sort out what it is on the chest CT, that kind of made me think about something vascular, and then I went digging, and you can just see this monster spleen and all these, but it looks like it's, all, it's decompressing right into the into this area there, so causing a mediastinal mass. And then my last case is kind of a, I hope I didn't show this one, I don't think I did. So this guy um, was uh, developed acute onset chest pain uh, after eating a bratwurst. And you can see he's got gas in the wrong places here. Uh, so we got some pneumomediastinum, let me make this bigger. But we also have a really nice example of gas in the wall of the esophagus. And we've called these esophageal dissections before, and I always use dissection in quotes. But clearly there's a full thickness tear somewhere because there's pneumomediastinum. Hmm. And um, you can see that right, right in here, there's something retained in the esophagus. That's probably the piece of bratwurst there. But, um, or just a broad as we call it around here in Wisconsin. But you can see right here, you know, the, just above the esophagastric junction, there's the full thickness tear in this vicinity right in there looks like and it's kind of cool because it actually tracks retrograde into the wall of the stomach so uh, it's, it's predominantly intramural but there is a defect and that you know just the extra luminal gas should be a clue to that and they went in um, and they removed the debris or they usually push it into the stomach and they put a stent across this that's that kind of the new treatment it seems like for these ruptured esophagus so it's it's a it's a small uh small tear but here's the esophagram let's see if i can run it here yeah it's, it's it's a pretty subtle tear but right there you can see that little bit of extra luminal area right there and then and sort of a little bit of tertiary contractions there and just do another sequence here but you know a classic wisconsin story and i if, if i remember correct it happened to the guy in the past before so he may have even had a stricture but you can see that nice defect there 
I'm not sure what the esophagram really adds when you've got a CT that shows it, but um, there it is. Wow. Yeah. So we've seen yeah, it. Wonder about I've shown a, oh, go ahead, Howard. No, you do wonder about intrinsic pathology in the esophagus. Even if he swallowed inadvertently a big piece of the verse, it's still a bad outcome. Yeah. But yeah, you can see it tracking there. But I've shown, I think I've shown a couple of esophageal, I don't know, dissections, what we kind of call it colloquial here. It's not, I don't think it's really a dissection, but it just shows you that the, that it's, it, I, I don't, it can affect management in some cases because, I mean, if you don't have a, a true leak, then you're not really worried about mediastinitis. Um, but um, we do see some of these where these, these partial thickness tears, and they can be harder to pick up on a barium study, um, unless, especially unless you're pretty experienced with them, uh, because you don't see the extravasation. You just see like persistent contrast in the wall. And if you don't have a good angle or, or you're, you're not, you're just, your bolus isn't great, sometimes you'll miss it. But uh, CT is really, I mean, we, we do CTs on all of these now, um, and you can see it quite well. So an esophageal dissection from an impacted bratwurst suspected a pre-existing stricture or something. So this, is, uh, Jeff, is that, do you think that gas is sub-adventitial? It seems to me that's the most likely compartment, right, in the esophageal wall to yeah, because the, the esophagus doesn't have a serosa layer, so it's it it's usually tracks in the muscle layers. Okay. Uh, probably between the longitudinal and transverse muscles would be my guess, because there is a little bit of tissue around it. Now, was there air getting into the uh, the into the trachea or tracheal wall too farther up? Uh, uh, no, that's just a, a thin membrane there. That's extraluminal gas. That's all pneumomediastinum. Well, so far, Jeff, um, in terms of, um, of Wisconsin cases, I would say this is the best of the worst. Oh, gosh, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, that was painful, uh, David. Chest pain. Uh, all right. Well, that's all I got. So if anybody has a few extra cases, we'll just end early today. Okay. All right. Great. Good Thank stuff. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys.